me just say that I, I've been very moved this morning by the way in which you show honour where honour is due to one another. I find that moving and impressive and inspiring. I, found, I thought it was particularly impressive uh, as you were honouring one another, particularly the women workers that you have amongst you. <coughs> I thought that was, I had tears in my eyes at that point, I have to confess. And the way that you were honouring each other's contributions. I think you actually have possibly more women deacons in this room than we have in the whole of the Church of England. Because it just is not a ministry that has been encouraged. Um, and it's been very difficult for women who want to serve in a complementarian sort of way, as deacons, not as priests to resist the pressure, to be pushed into that other ministry. So, I think it was marvellous that the way you wanted what people have been doing, and particularly the, those women workers. Um, as good Protestants, we believe, don't we, in the infallibility of the Bible, but not in the infallibility of the church or of bishops, which is why I feel confident that I can say, Bishop Julian, you are in error. <laughs> Not only about some of your pronunciation, which I'll take up with you later, <laughs> but you said that you were honoured by my presence here. By no means can that be true. <laughs> On the contrary, you honour me with your invitation here today and the welcome that I've received. I count it a huge privilege to be here and to speak with you today. This has to be, and I, I, I say this carefully, I've written down my words so that I'm not just making this up, don't take this as hyperbole. This is the best Darsison Synod I have been to in my entire life. <laughs> and I have been to a few, and they're usually turgid and not as inspiring and not as gospel focused as yours has been. So, thank you. I want you to know as well, the people of uh, Cana East and other guests, that there is no diocesan bishop in the Church of England who could have given that presentation that we had from Bishop Julian earlier. Uh -huh. faithfully, faithfully expanding the scriptures, delighting in our Reformation heritage, unapologetic about it, standing firm on the biblical doctrines that are under attack most in our societies today. In particular, what you said about the complementary roles of men and women in the church. We might have a couple of bishops in England who could join you in those things, but they're not diocesan bishops. I would die happy if we had one diocesan bishop like your diocesan bishop. And I say that not to flatter Julian, but so that you can pray for us, because that is a, that's a desperate situation, isn't it? It's great to be here with other bishops as well from Nigeria. I was greatly moved to meet other, others from northern Nigeria at the GAFCON conference some years ago. Your sacrifice and dedication to the gospel and the cause of Jesus Christ is inspiring to all of us. So thank you. In times when there is great controversy in the church, people often ask the question, how important is this issue, really? Is it worth going to the stake for? Or is it a secondary issue where we can just live and let live? Well, they asked that kind of question too during the Reformation. And I always find it sobering to reflect that in these days, when we have something of a doctrinal freefall, that people really were willing to go to the stake, a literal stake, for certain truths. The subject I've been asked to speak about first this morning is the Reformation Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer. Cranmer is an unusually influential and significant theologian, particularly for us. He was primarily responsible for giving us the Book of Common Prayer, and the 39 Articles of Religion, the doctrinal and liturgical basis of Anglicanism. 
and they remain today the gold standard of Anglican doctrine according to the law and canons of the Church of England. And they are used and cherished by millions in worldwide Anglicanism. In England, our reformers were also martyrs. They were burned at the stake for what they believed and taught. Why were they burned at the stake? It would be a great mistake to think that it was just because they refused to submit to the Pope in some vague way. The main reason that they were burned is that they refused one of Rome's distinctive doctrines. On that doctrine hinged their life or their death. If they admitted it, they might live. If they refused it, they would die. The doctrine in, in question was the real presence, physical presence of the body and blood of Christ in the consecrated elements of bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. Did they or did they not believe that the body and blood of Christ were really present in the bread and the wine when the words of consecration were pronounced? Was Jesus' body literally, physically there? Did they or did they not, they were asked, believe that the real body of Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, was present on the so-called altar as soon as the mystical words had left the priest's mouth? Did they or did they not? That was the simple question. If they did not believe and admit it, they were burned. Were they right, do you think, to be so inflexible on such a question? Right enough to die for their belief? That is difficult for many people today to accept. Some people think that this was just a silly argument over words. But you and I know that well-instructed, Bible-reading Protestants surely would not hesitate for a moment in answering this question. We can see at once that the Roman doctrine strikes at the very root of the Gospel. It underpins many of the errors of superstitious religion. So this is a real controversy over which intelligent men and women went to the stake. It would be good for us to examine this key doctrine to see whether or not we believe it so strongly ourselves as Reformation Christians. And if we do, whether or not this might also be a truth under attack in our present day and age as well, even while we focus our attention on other issues for much of the time. So let us then look at what Cranmer himself thought and taught about the Lord's Supper. One way to do that would be to expound his uh, very learned theological writings on the subject, which can be found in his book, A Defense of the True and Catholic Doctrine of the Sacrament of the Body and Blood of Our Saviour Jesus Christ, first published in 1550. But the method I'm going to follow today is to go back instead to his communion liturgy, the liturgy that Cranmer put together in 1552, and also to examine the 39 Articles of Religion, which he also drafted. And the first thing you notice about Cranmer's service is that he deliberately put it together in order to be a source of comfort and reassurance for Christians. It was, firstly, a divine instrument of assurance. Coming to a communion service in 1552 was designed to be a joyous and comforting thing for a believer to do. So the intention throughout the whole service is to reassure us of forgiveness and acceptance before God, not on the basis of our works, but on the basis of God's grace in Christ which in turn takes us in the service from very real and profound repentance over our sin to overwhelming thankfulness and gratitude to God. So just look at how the, the service is structured. We start in Cranmer's communion liturgy, praying the collect for purity, that God would cleanse our hearts and minds so that we can worthily glorify him 
We need to be purified by God himself in order to be able to approach him. And then we read his law, the Ten Commandments, slowly and soberly, asking God after each one to have mercy upon us and to write that law in our hearts. We then hear from God's word again in the readings and in the sermon. Not every minister in those days could preach, and so Cranmer and one or two others wrote some homilies or sample sermons, which were to be read by people at this point in the service instead. All good evangelical Protestant reformed stuff designed to win unbelievers in the congregation to Christ and to comfort and strengthen believers in their faith. We then exhorted in Crown Service to sort out our lives and our relationships with our neighbours and to confess our sins to Almighty God, to confess them, to be open about them with God and to repent. And then we are lifted up by God's declaration of forgiveness, not just by the words of a priest, but by the comfortable words, the words of comfort laid down in the, in the prayer. But Cranmer said at this point, we should be reading out verses like John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And 1 Timothy 1, 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So we are comforted, not so much by an absolution pronounced by a priest, but by God through his word. God himself, who forgives all who truly repent and believe the gospel. So then in the service, we lift up our hearts. We praise God. We assure the Lord we do not come to the table trusting in our own righteousness, which is nothing before him. We, we do not come because we're worthy or because we've lived good enough lives to earn a place at that table. No, we come trusting not in our own righteousness, but in God's manifold and great mercies that we heard about from Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. And so we come, you see, with nothing in our hands to receive God's mercy. It is all about God doing something for us, this service, isn't it? The whole thing is about God doing something for us. The movement, the action in the liturgy is all about that direction. God, in his grace, reaching down to us in our sinfulness. So then we take and we eat and we drink. We pray the Lord's Prayer, which he himself taught us. And then there's this oblation prayer, a prayer of praise and thanksgiving to God for what he's done for us. This prayer contains the first mention in the whole service of a sacrifice to God. Well after all the elements of bread and wine have been eaten and drunk. After that, we then offer not those items of food to God as a sacrifice. No, we offer ourselves, our souls and bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And then, just as the Lord's Supper, just as the Last Supper, I mean, uh, in Matthew 26, ended by the singing of a hymn, so we too, in the, in the Lord's Supper, sing a hymn. So you see how the whole service is put together as a divine instrument of assurance. Its intention is to show that we are more wicked than we ever thought, but also more loved by a merciful God than we ever dreamed. Cranmer's genius then was to take the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone. The idea we're made right with God entirely on the basis of his mercy and write it into liturgical form. And the result is, if you attend one of these services in 1552, that pastorally speaking, our consciences are assured of God's love towards us, even when we have been most searingly honest about our own failures and shortcomings. We are left in absolutely no doubt whatsoever about how God can be propitious and favourable towards us. It's not because of anything we've done or that we do in that service. 
It is simply because of the death of Christ on the cross, in our place, graphically symbolised by that broken bread and poured out wine. How can God forgive sinners? That's the question that people come to church with. How can God forgive me when I've done that, when I've thought that? Look at the post-communion prayer. I think I might have put it on the handout. Um, we thank and praise God in this post-communion prayer that by the merit and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. We're saved by Jesus' blood, by his merits, not by mine. Cranmer thought very carefully, you see, about how to arrange the service. Because how we arrange things, the order of our service, teaches doctrine. Yeah, how you arrange things in the service teaches doctrine. There are other ways in which Cranmer could have arranged this service. Other ways of phrasing the prayers which may have given a different message altogether. We could give the impression to God in our communion services that we are doing something for Him. That we are offering Him something. Going through the ritual for His benefits. But that would be to turn the Lord's Supper into another work that we are meant to do. Whereas Cranmer is concerned to make the whole service Preach the gospel of grace alone, from beginning to end. So this is an instrument of assurance. Secondly, Cranmer's theology, as seen in the communion service, is also an invitation, an invitation to feed on Christ. That is, he doesn't just see a communion service as a good opportunity to sit quietly and think about the cross. It is not just a visual aid or a dramatic illustration to help us understand. It is all those things, but it is also an invitation to take part in something. See, if it was just an illustration or a mere memorial service, then the priest, the minister, could simply perform certain actions up the front and the congregation wouldn't need to be involved at all, would they? If it's just a mere memorial, if it's just an illustration, like in a kid's talk or something, the priest could do it all on his own up the front and the congregation would be entirely passive as an audience. But in Cranmer's service, we are invited to take part as active participants. So look, for example, at the exhortation. Cranmer reminds us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, Dearly beloved in the Lord, ye that minds to come to the holy communion of the body and blood of our Saviour Christ, must consider what St. Paul writeth to the Corinthians, how he exhorted all persons diligently to try and examine themselves. To try there is not to... It's not like, you know, like Yoda says, do or don't do, there is no try. Um, he's, not saying, he's not saying you must try and examine yourself. He's saying you must try, as in on trial. Put yourself on trial. Test yourself. Examine yourself before you presume to eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For as the benefit is great, if with a truly penitent heart and lively faith we receive that holy sacrament, for then, if we do it with lively faith, then we spiritually eat the flesh of Christ and drink his blood. Then we dwell in Christ and Christ in us. We are one with Christ and Christ with us. So, on the other hand, is the danger great if we receive the same unworthily. For then we be guilty of the body and blood of Christ our Saviour. We eat and drink our own damnation. Not considering the Lord's body, we kindle God's wrath, his wrath against us. 
we provoke him to plague us with diverse diseases and sundry kinds of death. <laughs> That's a scary phrase, isn't it? Sundry kinds of death. Right there in the service, every single week, you are reminded of this. Don't take this lightly, or you face sundry kinds of death. So what is happening, according to this prayer, as we take the bread and drink the wine, we examine ourselves, our lives, our consciences, as Archbishop Foley told us yesterday. And then, if we eat and drink with faith, believing the gospel, we're not just then physically eating a bit of bread and drinking some wine, but something spiritual happens as well. So, we feed on Christ. Listen to what Cranmer says in the prayer of consecration. The minister says, Hear us, O merciful Father, we beseech thee and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. It could be a bit punchier, perhaps, and have fewer subordinate clauses, but the main point is clear. Grant that we, as we eat this, may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. In other words, as we eat it, in obedience to Christ, let us feed on Christ. Now it's important to notice it at that point, that we're not cannibals physically eating Christ. The eating is very clearly here spiritual. We spiritually feed on Him. That's also very clear in all of the words of the service. Where, um, imagine the words of administration. I think I put those on the handout too. You remember the words you're supposed to say to each parishioner as they come up. Now that teaches people as well, doesn't it? The words you say as they come up and take the bread and wine, that teaches people what your doctrine of the Lord's Supper is. If you just say, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, they may import all kinds of false understandings into that. You could believe in transubstantiation and say that to someone as they come up. What does Cranmer want us to say? as we give the bread and wine to people. He said, here's the bread, take and eat this. That is, again, don't be a passive spectator. Appropriate it for yourself. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, for you. You are assured that Christ's death on the cross all those years ago was to take the punishment for your sin. And it applies personally to you as one who has repented and prayed that confession and heard God's word of assurance. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your mouth. No, feed on him in your heart by faith. So physically you're feeding on some bread, but in your heart at the same time, if you believe in him, you are feeding on Christ. Christ is in your heart by faith, remember Ephesians 3 not physically in the bread. And all of this is done with great thanksgiving. Take it in this, in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. We are thankful for what Christ has done for us, to save us and to reconcile the Father to us. So as the bread and the wine become part of us bodily, so by faith, we dwell in Christ and He in us. It's that close. Union with Christ. And so you see, the supper is not just a, an edible visual aid. I've used edible visual aids. You know, you get the kids to come up and you drop some chocolates. Oh dear, they, they pick them up and you tell them about God giving you gifts or something. You know, it's an edible <laughs> visual aid. I mean, it's pretty easy, you just use chocolates and the kids are, you know, it's fine. Um, that's not what the Lord's Supper is. It's not just an edible visual aid. The eating and the drinking is an integral part of what is going on. Something happens when we eat the bread and drink the wine. Either we feed on Christ in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Or as Cranmer put it when summarising that passage from 1 Corinthians 11, we eat and drink our own. Remember, some in the Corinthian church were sick and some had died 
And the Apostle Paul linked that specifically with their abuse of the Lord's Supper. Can't get much more serious than that. Now obviously there are many other things we could say about the positive aspects of the Lord's Supper and Cranmer's theology of the Lord's Supper. But let me also look at some of the things that Cranmer was specifically saying no to. And these are what got him burned. Isn't that often the case? It's not necessarily the positive things you say, but it's the things you say no to that get you into trouble. Not always, but often. So what was Cranmer guarding against? I think that's on the second side of the handout, if you're following along with that. See, Cranmer didn't just put this service together in a vacuum. He didn't sit down one day with a blank sheet of paper and say, what should I put in my communion service? No, people were used to the Mass, the medieval version of the Lord's Supper, which had a very different way of going about these things. So we can only properly understand what Cranmer was doing when we know what Cranmer was rejecting, what he leaves out, what he changes. Cranmer was guarding against certain theological errors which had misled people since before the Reformation. And it's as we see what he was guarding against that we see why it is so important for us today to also take these things seriously. Because Cranmer thought that what was at stake, I use the word advisedly, what was at stake here was nothing less than the gospel. The first thing that he guards against is any idea that the atonement, Christ's death on the cross, was insufficient for our salvation. People were saying it was insufficient. And he guards against that in two ways. First, by his use of the language of sacrifice. And second, by the way in which he presents the minister. Cranmer makes it very clear that what is going on at the table is not a sacrifice on an altar made by a mediating priest on behalf of the people, which has to be repeated again and again to be effective. That's the message you got from the Roman Catholic Mass, from the medieval Mass. In the Catholic Mass, something is offered to God. Instead, Cranmer says is that Christ's once and for all sacrifice on the cross was utterly, completely, totally sufficient to pay for our sins. No additional sacrifices are necessary. You can see this so clearly by looking at the words of consecration. Um, just listen to the repeated emphasis. Can you see them on the uh, handouts, the words of consecration? The person administering the supper is to say, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, which of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ. God gave something to us, not us giving to God. To suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. Who made there, not here, nothing's happening here, who made there by his one oblation of himself, once offered, what's the offer? A full, perfect, sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory, not a reenactment or representation of his precious death until he comes again. Cranmer likes to bang home his point, doesn't he? I mean, how can he make it any clearer, you ask? There is no sense at all that what is happening here at the table is a sacrifice. All the language of making a sacrifice is kept until way after all the bread and the wine has gone. It's been eaten. Only then do we pray that God would accept to use the language of Hebrews 13, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Only then, after all the bread and wine is gone, do we offer and present ourselves to God as living sacrifices, holy to God, to use the language of Romans 12. All of that is after, not as we come to the table, but after. So there is nothing at all that needs to be added 
to the atonement, to make it complete or to make it effective. The sacrifice of the cross doesn't need to be repeated or represented or reenacted or anything to be effective. Now, some people have criticised Cranmer for not removing all use of the word priest from the service, which could have made that even clearer in some ways and made the minister look less like a, an Old Testament sacrificing priest. And perhaps, perhaps there is a case for that. He could have rephrased it. The English word priest could be a shortened form of presbyter, I think that's where it comes from. But even if that was the case, even if you leave the word in, look at how Cranmer presents the priest. What does he do? He makes no sacrifice. He stands next to a table to administer, not preside, to administer a meal rather than standing behind an altar to perform a sacrifice. And he stands at the north end of it. That is, he stands at the side rather than standing like a mediator in between the people and God. It, like in the mass, which is the eastward position. I sometimes, I sometimes present this in a very dramatic way. Are you ready for that? Yeah. It's very un-English. Yeah. Since I'm in America, I can be un-English for a bit. Okay. Here, just want you to feel the difference, okay? Here is a medieval version. I'm going to go all the way up here. I'll turn my back on you. I'm going to mumble in Latin. How do you feel at this point? Great. Passive spectators, a bit removed from things. You can't understand what I'm saying. What does Cranmer do? He gets the table made of wood and he brings it down here, or maybe even here. Now, how do you feel? Do you feel more comfortable? <laughs> now, how do you feel? I'm speaking to you in English, not in Latin. Some of you speak English. <laughs> <laughs> or a form of English. And we're here. We're, so, we're having a meal together in the midst of a congregation. And you can just, just that brief way of doing that shows that you feel more with it. You're part of it. And that's what Crime was trying to do. Um, and so presenting the minister as administering a meal, it's very different. The minister also doesn't take private confessions from everybody before the service so that they have to compulsory confess their, their sins to a priest in a box over there. Instead, he leads the conglomerate act of confession together. And it's all in English, not in Latin. So the intention of the service is to keep the language of sacrifice where the Bible does. It is not happening here at the table, it happened there, at the cross. The only thing we offer to God is ourselves, as a living sacrifice, in gratitude for what Christ has done for us. So by a right view of sacrifice and a corrected view of the minister's role within the whole business, Cranmer sought to guard against alternative theologies which presented the atonement as somehow insufficient on its own for our salvation. The second thing Cranmer wanted to guard against was any idea that the incarnation was not real. Any idea that the incarnation was not real. That is, God the Son really did take human flesh and become a human being like you and like me. He really did that. He had a real, physical, human body with all its glories and its limitations, taking his physical human nature from the Virgin Mary. It was because he was a real human being that he could truly represent us and be our substitute on the cross. To the extent that our theology makes his body different from ours, he is unable to be our substitute and representative. That is clearly a principle in theology, isn't it? But who's denying it? it sounds so obvious and right. He's got to be a real physical human being like you and like me, otherwise he can't represent me and he can't 
die in my place. Well, who's denying that? Well, there were two groups of people. Firstly, the Roman Catholic Church taught and still teaches that as the words of institution are said in the prayer of consecration in the Mass, the substance of the bread and the wine is changed into the physical body and blood of Christ. You can't see the difference, they say, but the substance in the elements has changed. Christ is really there in his human nature, in the elements of bread and wine on the altar. The bread and the wine have been transubstantiated, transubstantiated, changed in substance. We know about transsexual, uh, changing sex, changing gender, and now this is the same word, trans, it should change, change substance. Christ's body, changed in substance, bread and wine, changed in substance, becomes his body and blood, which is then offered to God as a propitiation for our sins. That is the language used in the Mass. The Mass is a propitiatory sacrifice that turns away God's wrath. Secondly, Martin Luther, who was such good news in so many ways, taught that Christ also in some sense was physically present in the Eucharist, in the elements of bread and wine, wherever the Lord's Supper is celebrated. So Lutherans teach that Christ's human nature is ubiquitous. It is everywhere and anywhere at the same time because it is joined to Christ's divine nature as God. So uh, Christ can be physically present here on this altar and in your church, on your altar, and your church, on your altar, and he can be in all of these different places all at the same time. Luther doesn't believe in transubstantiation like the Roman Catholics, but his view of Christ's human nature was equally wrong, according to Cranmer. Because where is Christ? Yes, he is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, with a body like ours, which cannot be in two places at once. Unless anyone here has worked out how to bilocate. Can you do that? Can you be in two places at once? No, I can't. And Christ's body is the same. And he will remain there. What does the creed say? He's seated at the right hand of the Father till he comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead. So if Christ was physically here present with us, he would be here to judge the living and the dead. And this is made clearest, I think, in Cranmer's 1552 communion service by the addition of the black rubric at the end. A rubric, of course, is an instruction, a stage direction, if you like. And it has a complicated history, but was added here to make it clear that um, just because people were being asked to kneel to receive the bread of the wine, um, it didn't mean that they were kneeling in adoration of the physical presence of Christ which some superstitiously thought they were doing. This is what the, the black rubric says, it's on the hand I think. For as concerning the sacramental bread and wine, they remain still in their very natural substance, and therefore may not be adored, for that were idolatry to be abhorred of all faithful Christians. And so concerning the natural body and blood of our Saviour Christ, they're in heaven and not here, both. He has to put both in. There is in heaven, and not here. For it is against the truth of Christ's true natural body to be in more places than in one at one time. You'll see that same truth expressed in Article 28 of our 39 Articles, part of which says, transubstantiation, the change of the substance of the bread and wine in the supper of the Lord, cannot be proved from Holy Scripture, but is repugnant, contradictory to the plain teaching of Scripture. In fact, it overthrows the nature of a sacrament and has given rise to many superstitions. The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only in a heavenly and spiritual manner. There's another alone that we don't always hear about to do with the Reformation, do we? I like them, I and whoever ended those five solas as a way of summarising the Reformation truths, that's great. 
I don't think Luther quite summarized it that way or any one at the time, but those solos are good. Here's another one. But it's equally important to cram that. The body of Christ is given, taken and eaten in the supper only in a heavenly and spiritual manner. The means by which the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. Faith alone. So he's saying transubstantiation is wrong because it overthrows the truth of the incarnation. <clears throat> Finally, Cranmer wanted also to guard against superstitious idolatry. But that is not the only problem with transubstantiation. The Roman Catholic system of theology and practice also encouraged superstition and idolatry, according to Cranmer. From the rubric, we can see that one of the concerns in 1552 was to protect English churchgoers from that idolatry, that false worship, which is to be abhorred by all faithful Christians. So he made it clear that normal bread was perfectly acceptable. It doesn't have to be wafers with a picture of Christ on it or something like that. Normal bread. And the minister could just eat any leftovers himself later, though there's some slight alterations to that in the 1662 book. It is clear, though, that as Article 28 says, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not instituted by Christ to be reserved, to be used later, to be carried about in a procession of some sort, to be lifted up, or to be worshipped. That's not what it's for. Christ did not intend us to reserve bits of bread in a special place after the service as if they were his real body, his natural presence on earth to be guarded. Guarding Jesus? Just think about that for a minute, you know. Who needs to guard Jesus? He doesn't need us to guard. This is the guy with the word, calm the storm. Does he need us to guard him in a little ornery or something? Yeah. No. It is not also to be carried about in a procession like a talisman or a magic charm or worshipped and adored as if it was actually physically Jesus. It is just bread. Nothing magical has happened to it. There's no, as we say, no hocus pocus involved. In fact, you know that supposedly magical phrase, hocus pocus, comes from the Latin mass. I can see none of you nodding, you know this. So that in the Mass, there's this long discussion about uh, where exactly the transubstantiation happens. And medieval theologians discuss this. Where is, and it, becomes, it must be in that bit of the consecration prayer where he's reciting uh, the words of institution from Jesus, where Jesus says, this is my body. So it's, it's in that phrase, this is my body somewhere. And no one can quite decide, is it on this or is it on body? So where does, he, where does it exactly happen, the transubstantiation? So many priests would say it really quickly. <laughs> and in Latin, it's hoc est corpus meum. And if you keep saying that quickly, it sounds like hocus pocus. It sounds like hocus pocus. <laughs> and that's where the phrase comes from. And John Calvin, who agrees with Cranmer on all of these major points, says in the Mass, the Roman Catholic Mass, consecration was virtually equivalent to magic incantation. Hocus pocus. And he warns that liturgy is not about magic, it is about preaching. I think I put the quote on the handout. Here, we should not imagine some magic incantation, supposing it enough to have mumbled the words as if they were to be heard by the elements. Let us understand that these words are living preaching, which edifies the hearers. It penetrates into their minds and it presses itself on their hearts and settles there. And I hope you have caught a glimpse this morning of how Cranmer's liturgy is a form of preaching rather than something out of Harry Potter. <laughs> By putting the service together in this particular way, he intended to teach us something about our salvation and to invite us to accept it and to believe the gospel.
Now, Cranmer suffered terribly when Queen Mary came to the throne in 1553 and reinstated Roman Catholicism. He was kept in prison for three years, in solitary confinement for much of that, in severe conditions for an old man now in his late 60s. He was forced to recant what he believed about transubstantiation and to have a full retraction of all his supposedly heretical views published throughout the land. Under pressure, he went along with it to save his life. And still the Queen decided she was going to put him to death anyway. As he was led to the stake to be burned in the centre of Oxford, he just pause there and say, of course he was a good Cambridge man, Cranmer, like all the best theologians. <laughs> and as you know, Cambridge makes all the great reformers and Oxford burns them. <laughs> And as he's led to the stake in Oxford, of course, he is allowed to give one final speech. With his very last words, he confessed he had indeed written a recantation of all his Protestant views and denied his previous teaching about communion, which we have been studying. And then he said, I did it to save my life, but all such papers which I have written or signed since my degradation, I now renounce as untrue, and for as much as my hand hath offended by signing this recantation, it shall first be punished. His very last words to the crowd defended his views of the Lord's Supper. He says, as for the sacrament, I believe as I taught in my book, and the doctrine my book teaches shall stand at the last day before the judgment of God, where the papistical doctrine, the doctrine of the Pope, shall be ashamed to show its face. Fox reports in the glorious Book of Martyrs, then was an iron chain tied around Cranmer, and the fire was set unto him. When the wood was kindled, and the fire began to burn near him, he stretched forth his right hand, which had signed his recantation, into the flames, and there he held it, so that people could see it burnt to a coal before his body was touched. That's how passionately Cranmer believed what he had written with that hand about the Lord's Supper. For him, it was a gospel issue, something worth going to the stake for, because of the implications for people's salvation should wrong views of communion be accepted. It's interesting just to reflect in this 500th anniversary year that John Calvin, Martin Luther and many of the other reformers died natural, sometimes painful, but natural deaths in their beds. What a story it would have made if the Pope's soldiers had conquered Geneva and John Calvin had been put on trial and then burned him at the stake. What a story that would have been. Imagine the fuss if Wittenberg had fallen to the Roman Catholic Emperor, and Luther had been captured and killed for heresy. They would have gone out in a blaze of glory, wouldn't they? Luther and Calvin. And yet God did not appoint such a martyr's death for those two men. Instead, he chose a personally more timid man. God chose a man who of all the major reformers was probably least equipped constitutionally for it, to seal his life's work with his blood. In the weakness of his flesh, he may have wavered for a moment, but God gives grace to help in time of need. Cranmer died as a faithful servant of the Lord and his gospel. And then Queen Elizabeth, of blessed memory, reinstated Cranmer's prayer book in 1559. So his legacy is that for hundreds of years, the official liturgy of the Church of England and her doctrinal standards all embody his teaching. And thus millions of English-speaking people around the world have been taught from infancy in church every week about the sufficiency of the cross to save us, even in the depths of our sin.
and they've been invited to participate in Christ by his grace to our eternal comfort. Now the Church of England has, in recent years, abandoned Cranmer's liturgy, not just in practice because the language was getting a bit outdated, but in principle as well. Newer liturgies, not to mention the illegal use of Roman Catholic liturgies by some Anglican ministers, shame be it said, undermine the gospel foundations that Cranmer had established. And inevitably this has dire pastoral consequences for many congregations, which are now without a clear and unambiguous witness to the gospel in their weekly religious diet. So much so that what is needed now, I venture to say, is more men of the calibre of Archbishop Thomas Cranmer to reform and to educate us again about the gospel. Men who are willing to study hard, to understand the scriptures, work tirelessly for the reform of the church and preach clearly of the full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice made by Christ on the cross for us. Men willing to go to the stake for that gospel, like our brother Thomas Cranmer was. But then all churches, not just the Church of England, need men and women like that. Amen. Amen. Amen.